welcome to another episode of s and It's been kind of a wild last few weeks. I feel like, you know, downhill of summer, here's Labor Day and school starting and, but it's hot. It's hot. It's still hot outside. Well, well at the time of this recording song, my children, uh, well, one of my children has gone to college. So my child, my daughter, uh, is they're getting out of school early today and tomorrow. They're getting out of school two hours early because the schools are so hot and they don't have air conditioning and it's too hot here for them to be in school and learn. So yeah, so my daughter Maya is going home from school early today. Oh my gosh, but you did, you did just take Olivia up uh, to start college up in Washington yeah. State. So that's Go very Zags. exciting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my daughter also started college. So yeah, it's been kind of a wild few weeks. It's almost like time is progressing and we can't stop it. <laughs> weird. <laughs> <laughs> it is weird. It is weird. Well, we'll do a quick episode here for you all out there in interpreter land. Um, yeah. Paul, we've got elections coming up. We have NAI elections. We are electing a new president, a new vice president for administration, and three at-large board members. And so those elections are ongoing. If you are an NAI member, you should have received your ballot by email, please let me know if you did not, and we will make sure that you get a ballot. So yeah, this uh, important process, you know, it's, it's every, it, the more participation we can get, the the more voices are heard in, in determining the future of the organization. There's also a ballot initiative on there to change the constitution of uh, NAI to, to reflect a different structure for our board of directors. So get in there, check it out, read up on it, and vote yay or nay on that, because that's also important that, that our members' voices are heard. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And um, gosh, you've got a new issue of Legacy Magazine coming out. And with that said, we have a special guest today. Absolutely. Well, hi, AJ. Thanks for being here. Hello. Thanks for having me. Oh, man. So AJ, you are a, uh, a longtime NAI member, a regional leader for several different regions. You've been uh, back when it was the Pacific Northwest region. You were the director of that region. Now you're the director of our Four Corners region because you live here in Fort Collins, Colorado. My neighbor, as Ned Flanders would say, "Highly ho, neighborino." <laughs> uh, and uh, and and yeah, you've been such a huge part of NAI over the years, and now you are the author of an an upcoming legacy article for our accessibility issue of Legacy Magazine. This is the fourth in a series of five legacy magazine issues uh, on Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, accessibility, and inclusion. And so, yeah, you're, you, you have the, the cover article, which I am showing here right now while we're talking. And uh, it, is, it is on the work that you're doing with uh, Fort Collins natural areas to make sure that the 50 natural areas in the city of Fort Collins are accessible to everybody. So can you just talk a little bit about the, the subject matter of your article and you know the, the work that you're doing with city of Fort Collins to make trails accessible? Sure, sure. And I'm a part of a team of several people who are who are working on this, including folks from, um, so I'm part of the public engagement team um, doing public education and public community activities and programming. Uh, but the team working on this project also includes our trails and visitor amenities folks. So who the folks who deal with all the trails and the bathrooms and um, the structures on our natural areas, and then also our planning team and our ranger team. So it was really, it was really a team effort on the natural area side to uh, do this project that I wrote about. And so we are going through a new way to do our planning process where we're getting more frequent feedback on particular areas of the natural areas in Fort Collins. And this year, it was what we call the mountains to plains zone, which basically means it was soapstone prairie. Soapstone prairie is our biggest natural area. It's like the Yellowstone of Fort Collins natural areas. It's we like to call it one of our one of our, our crown jewels. I guess we have endangered species that live out there. Beautiful, pristine uh, short grass prairie, uh, but it is an hour from town. So. Um, not everybody has the ability to, to get up there easily. So it's way up on the, on the Wyoming border. Uh, there's a little bit of a trek to get up there. One of the things that we identified when we were looking at 
this natural area and this planning process is really looking at how to make soapstone, this beautiful area, more accessible for more people in our community. And the best way to do that, um, people may have heard the nothing about us without us when you're talking about accessibility, the best way to do that is to work with community consultants who identify as a person or persons with disability. And that is kind of what we did. Um, it wrapped into another project that I was working on about getting accessible trail equipment, like off-roading wheelchairs and things like that. Um, we sent out a survey to some community partners and essentially asked who would be interested and willing taking a field trip that we organize up to Soapstone Prairie and giving us feedback on what you see up there, what would make it a more inclusive, accessible, and welcoming environment for you to want to come visit. And so we had uh, six people who volunteer, well, vol they, they put their names forward to do that. And then uh, we did pay them as a consultant for the day uh, for the trip up there and uh, took them up, said, basically said, hey, this is, this is the area we would love to get your feedback on and then kind of let folks, uh, let folks explore and, uh, and we just went around with everyone and kind of talked to them and had conversations about, okay, what's working really well? What do you love? In addition to the like, hey, check all of this cool, uh, cool plants out and let's look at the bison. So we did fun stuff and um, looked at things like how big are the bathrooms and where are the signs placed? And um, is this trail that's accessible grade actually accessible if you're in a manual wheel wheelchair, things like that. Um, just had amazing feedback from everyone and uh, really, really got beyond just what's required by the ADA laws. Uh, so here's what the law says you have to have to be accessible. Uh, but we got such great feedback from people saying, yes, that's what the law says, but here's other other things that would just make this a friendlier environment. And that's, that I think was the true value of, of, this, of this project and something we hope to continue. So AJ, you mentioned, I mean, accessibility has so many definitions, right? And you mm -hmm. said um, some particular instances um, of physical disabilities, but you also mentioned in our kind of pre-conversation that you also had a second focus on like cognitive and developmental um, disabilities. So explain a little bit about, about that and that process. Yeah, so um, I mean, when people think of, of accessibility, you know, like people you, who are using mobility devices is usually where your brain goes first or people who have um, like a vision impairment, but uh, also people with developmental and cognitive intellectual disabilities are a part of that as well. And so we partner with the Arc of Larimer County, which is an organization that serves that population and uh, also had a folks representative of that community come up to as part of the field trip and talk about what would make, what would make Soapstone a friendlier place uh, in their minds. And a lot of that had to do with like clear signage and knowing what to expect before they got there and what their resources were if they felt unsafe, how to be safe, how long the trail was, just having, having a lot of that information upfront about what the experience was going to be like was a lot of the feedback that we got from, from that. There was, we got, we got tons of feedback that was amazing, um, but that's also the same for anyone, right? We wanna know if you're going to an unfamiliar place, it's you want to know what to expect when you get there and how far is the trail and how steep is it and what kind of surface is it and all of those things can help you feel immediately more comfortable so if you're if you're recommending um if someone came to you from another interpretive site and said hey you know this we're we're amazed by your legacy article and they have to fight their way through the paparazzi after you're a legacy cover <laughs> article author right you know so they have to they have to fight to get to you but finally when they reach you when their people contact your people and they get you on the horn and they say aj we want to do something similar at our site what sort of timeline would you give them to complete uh an assessment like this yeah so this project start to finish 
So my, my colleague, Christy Bruce, was uh, a big influence. I want to call her out specifically in helping this timeline happen. Um, but we started in January as far as like developing the logistics of how this trip was going to go. And then um, we used, part, we used uh, partnerships that I had been developing uh, to, we would go, we would go to meetings, we would go to group gatherings, we would go to events uh, to try to develop relationships with people who are a part of both the physical disability, um, developmental disability, who, who identify as parts of those communities to get to know them, get to know what they were interested in. Um, so we started that process kind of in December, January, and we went on the field trip in June. So it, uh, it was like a six month, six month process of getting, getting to know folks from the community and then also just bringing together all the logistics of uh, renting the vans, making sure we had vans that were uh, wheelchair accessible, uh, and just making sure we knew exactly what we wanted out of the day so we could communicate that and to the folks who were participating and also checking our budget and making sure we had enough money to, to pay everyone appropriately who participated. So um, that's how long it took. I don't know that it'll take that long next time now that we've done it once because now we've, we've developed these relationships, right? We had to find people who are willing to to be a part of a part of that and now we've started to develop these relationships and can hopefully uh, work with those folks again and then the, the feedback that you got from these participants how much of that do you actually have the budget to act on uh you know what what's the timeline for actually implementing any changes that come from the the feedback that you received well and just to tack on to that also i want to know um how do you prioritize? I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure you got just a ton of feedback, right? But given boundaries of budget, um, how do you pick and choose what things um, make it to the top of that list? Yeah, so that is uh, that is what my colleague Christy does. She's part <laughs> of our planning team. And so she actually took all of the feedback that we got, made a big spreadsheet out of it and said, okay, this is easy to implement. This will be difficult to implement. This is going to be inexpensive and easy. This is going to be inexpensive and difficult. This is going to be expensive and difficult, but really important. Um, and so she is taking all of that feedback and prioritizing it. And over the next few years in between this planning cycle and our next planning cycle, uh, the both the planning team and other teams like if it has something to do with signage, that would be the public engagement team. If it has something to do with the way the trail is structured, that would be our trails team. We'll go ahead and implement the priorities that have been identified by from this process. So we've already started, they've already gone up and kind of priced out and looked looked at what might be the most, the most important and things we can do first and things we can do later. So uh, we've been in touch with the folks who are part of the consultants to update them and say, hey, this is um, this is what we're doing with the information that you gave us. So who on like how did this whole project come about? Right, was this kind of your team bringing this to the you know the management, um, or is this kind of from the top down? Just curious what that what that how how it started. <laughs> yeah, I would say accessibility and more accessibility of natural areas has uh, always been a priority department wide with our teams, whether that's the public engagement team, the trails team, the planning team. Um, and sometime in 2020, 2021, all of our public engagement staff kind of, I guess, took on particular community partners that we wanted to provide better service to. So uh, access, accessibility and community members with disabilities was kind of my focus. Um, so between myself, Christy, during her update of this planning process, our trails team, I think it just all kind of came together at once. We had an accessibility survey that came back. So we had just a bunch of things all coming together at once that uh, kind of culminated in being able to do the first of what we hope is many uh, consultant field trips. <laughs> So obviously, uh, accessibility means a lot of different things. And this issue of legacy is going to has, has a bunch of great articles that really get into different kinds of accessibility. But one of the things you did in your cover story was uh, you wrote using uh, what you called principles of plain language, which I know is a phrase that you did not make up, but it's one that you certainly implemented in this article. 
Uh, I had not seen it before in Legacy Magazine, and I've been editing Meg Legacy Magazine for a long time. So can you talk about uh, you know, your decision to, to use the principles of plain language and what that means and, and why you did it? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, plain language is uh, a type of writing style that is meant to be more accessible to more people when you're reading. Um, it is kind of the opposite of how we're taught to write in school. Uh, how we're taught to write in school is, you know, you got to get this many words in and it has to be this long. And I don't know about any about either of you, but I learned like the more big words I use, like the longer they were and the more words I use, the less I actually had to come up with to write because I could like use 10 words to say something I could say in three. And then I had to come up with fewer ideas for my papers. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm the only one who did that. <laughs> I doubt You're it. You're the only one. I've never heard of that. <laughs> um, but plain language kind of turns that around and um, is writing in shorter sentences, shorter paragraphs, using common words to make sure that as many people as possible can access that information cognitively. So I attended um, a seminar, a free seminar on principles of plain language for nonprofits and governments from the self-advocacy network. Uh, and that is, uh, it's selfadvocacyinfo.org. They're a really great organization run by people uh, who are advocates for themselves, who themselves have cognitive or um, neurodiverse identities and are trying to uh, help other people understand how to make writing and all sorts of things more accessible. So I use those principles of plain language, which is like, like I said, shorter sentences, shorter paragraphs, common words, clear and straightforward language, active voice instead of passive voice, uh, using examples whenever possible, breaking things into lists. All of that helps to bring down the reading level overall and just to make sure that what I'm communicating is very, very clear. Um, and I learned how to do that through attending that seminar and actually referred back to their information a lot. And then I double checked how I did <laughs> because Microsoft Word has an accessibility checker that checks for these things um, to make it a little bit easier uh, for me to see, oh yes, I still used a bunch of passive passive voice words, which um, my trick was if I could read the sentence and then add by zombies at the end and it made sense, uh, then that was passive voice rather than active voice. There wasn't a clear who was doing the thing in the sentence. So that was also a trick I learned from that class. And yeah, it was a lot more difficult than I thought because of how how my brain is wired to think of how I'm supposed to write, like what does good writing look like? Mm -hmm. uh, but I felt like it was really valuable in writing about accessibility to demonstrate, not only are we trying to make efforts in making our spaces more accessible, but our, our resources and our, and our writings to the community as well. I was gonna say, I can corroborate the efficacy of utilization of abbreviated uh, grammar and usage. Oh my God! Otherwise, obfuscates the significance. <laughs> okay, stop. Oh, no. I, think I need to require all my e incoming emails be written <laughs> in. <laughs> to, to be to use the, the the principle of plain language. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, from a, from a legal standpoint, um, especially like I work for a government agency and really everything we put out to the public should be written in plain language because yeah. um, part of our community. Yeah. Uh, needs that type of access, and that's something that uh, you're starting to see more of. If you if you speak, uh, you can speak a gover government, um, but it should be translated to plain language that everyone can understand um, without using those like um, industry specific terms unless they're defined. So. Well, AJ, thank you so much. This has been really such a, an important discussion for for interpreters everywhere to be having about how do we. How do we make our, our sites and our, our places more accessible to everybody? They're for everybody, as you say in the article. And that's uh, yeah, that's a great point that you drive home. And so thank you again, AJ. I know it's not your first time contributing to Legacy Magazine. It's not your first time on S&P. So we appreciate everything that you do for NAI and, this, uh, and, and coming and discussing this very important topic with us. 
Well, thank you so much for giving me the chance to bring a little more visibility to it. And I can't wait to read the, the next edition of Legacy and see what interpreters uh, around the world are doing. Yeah, thanks, AJ. Thanks. It's always good to see AJ. We were, I saw her since I don't live in Fort Collins. I saw her at the board meeting uh, like a month or so ago. So that was really nice to, to catch up with her then and always nice to have her on the S&P. But uh, just in wrapping up, Paul, we are full steam ahead with conference, of course, in Boy. Cleveland. Um, early bird registration has closed. So now we're at the regular registration. I think next week, Paul, we're going to announce the nine sessions that will be um, live streamed for our yeah. virtual attendees. So Stay tuned for that. that. I have it slated for Tuesday afternoon that we're announcing the nine sessions that are going to be available to virtual attendees. Uh, and that's very exciting. And I know that you and I have sort of looked at them together and we've got a, a, a fancy slate of, <laughs> of sessions that are going to be make for a really great uh, a virtual version of the national conference. Yep, absolutely. So if you're not yet registered, get yourself registered, um, book your hotel room for sure. Uh, so yeah. you can, you know, I don't know, jump up and down on your bed and keep me away. I don't know. Get your reservation. I spend, at the hotel. <laughs> I spend the whole year looking forward to the national conference. It's always so much fun getting together with folks. And obviously, you know, we can't take any of that for granted these days, right? Like we cannot take for granted the, you know, the, the idea that we're going to be able to meet in person. And so the fact that we're at a place right now where, uh, you know, we are, are comfortable meeting in person. Let's let's all go do it. Let's all go let's be in person and, and be there and, and talk about interpretation and, and share ideas and inspiration and expertise. And and so I think we're going to have a great time. Interpreters, you know, we, we have fun anywhere, but, you know, Cleveland's a cool little city and we're going to have a great time. It is true. It's true. Keep an eye out for the conference emails that go out once a month. Lots of fun facts and good information in those as well. Um, otherwise, if you have questions, you can email conferences at interpnet.com and we'll get right back to you. But with that so, uh, said, Paul, I guess we better peace out. Till peace next out, time. Indeed. See you in <laughs> Cleveland, everybody. Well, we'll see you, you know, in two weeks on S&P. Okay. <laughs>